Uh, first of all, IT World Canada with iCanada is launching the study. And I've been working very closely with Barry. And I thank iCanada for its support. We feel that this is a very important study. Uh, IT World as a publisher likes to find a few very important movements that they can get behind. I think you heard them all here today. So besides the intelligent city and crowdfunding, we also have open data. And for me, it's kind of going back to the past because I started my career with open systems. So without further ado, I'm turning this over to Yuri. Thanks very much, Vaughn. Uh, open data is, a, is certainly a, a passion of mine, and it's a bit of a collaboration because this is Barry's uh, laptop, so thank you, Barry. Uh, just uh, next slide, please. When we talk about open data, it's really about access, transparency, and leveraging municipal government data. And, and I think that's one of the things that we don't realize enough in, in municipal government, and I spent 10 years there, is understanding that the data is a huge strategic asset that probably isn't leveraged the way that it should be. And when we look at then the assets of all of the various governments and combine them, there's a huge potential that's untapped right now. So, Accessibility as both digital data via the web or mobile devices is something that is happening and it's gained momentum. Certainly in the last two or three years I've seen it uh, expand and it's very pervasive because we can see it all the way from the World Bank right until all levels of government and municipal governments quite frankly are the leaders in this domain. Probably the reason is because they're agile, right? If you're comparing levels of government, the municipal governments are the most agile, and I think that's to our advantage because we're all talking about the fact that if we're looking at moving forward with innovation and making progress, that it's at the local level. This is a, an illustration of uh, where the open data exists globally. Uh, it's a map that was produced by, uh, by a nonprofit out of, uh, out of Paris, uh, and it shows 189 catalogs. Uh, open data catalogs that exist throughout the world. It indicates that there are 22 in Canada, but I can tell you that I know that there are over 30, so it's a little bit out of date. But it gives you some kind of sense of how pervasive open data is globally. When we look at uh, you know, what you actually see, quite often it's uh, you know, the data catalogs themselves. And I've illustrated on the left-hand side there that we have open data that's coming from uh, the World Bank. And I noticed a tweet that uh, next week is called Open Access Week. It's an international event, and the World Bank uh, is, uh, is taking on some initiative there uh, and live streaming it. And I've shown the two kind of leading examples of open data uh, you know, at the national level. Uh, and it's the U.S. and it's the U.K. It's, it's certainly not Canada. We're a little bit behind, maybe about two or three years behind, uh, the, the level of activity that is happening in those countries. On the right-hand side, uh, you're seeing the open data catalogs or the, or the landing pages for those uh, for Toronto, for Ottawa, uh, Edmonton, uh, Vancouver, uh, Calgary, uh, and Montreal. And the first four that I mentioned uh, formed a group called the G4 a couple of years ago. And uh, I was privileged to uh, work on a project to create the open data framework for them. Uh, and there's a lot of progress and collaboration that is starting among a lot of different groups of municipalities, but not necessarily at a, at a national level. We need that national collaboration happening for, for, open, uh, for open data. So next slide, please. So, why open data? You know, why would we consider that for, for municipalities? One of the things is that they can offer efficiencies, enhanced service delivery, and there's an economic development uh, opportunity here, and it relates obviously to innovation. Uh, so municipalities are the, uh, are the front uh, line for service and must be both proactive and innovative in the way that they deliver service and dealing with uh, requests from, um, from their citizens and their businesses uh, and they need to be proactive about it, particularly with the restraint on resources that they currently have. And the majority of municipalities, uh, you know, living in uh, majority of citizens are living in municipalities, are looking for government to enhance their e-service delivery, whether that's through the web or through a mobile application, uh, the whole uh, range of sensor webs, some of which we've, uh, we've heard about today, uh, it, it continues. 
and the need to move towards intelligent systems and thereby becoming intelligent communities or a part thereof. Next slide. So when we look at the government efficiencies and effectiveness, interestingly enough in government, irrespective of what level of government, uh, many governments actually don't know what data they have. And that data before, we talked about it being a strategic asset. It's not an asset if you don't know it exists, and it's not an, a, a, an asset if there's only one small group within government that's able to access that. So looking at the access to the internal data, the reduced costs related to requests for that data, whether it's coming internally or externally, uh, the amount of time and money that is spent in dealing with requests for data is significant. And also opening up the data assistance systems integrations, systems that don't typically talk to each other. When we understand kind of the infrastructure that we have around data, the ability to, to integrate some of the systems and get them working together uh, to our mutual benefit uh, is going to happen. Enhanced service delivery. The actual direct access to government information as opposed to always having to rely on FOI, you know, pulling the information. Uh, and then the, uh, the new software applications uh, for citizens that are derived from the data being made available. And it was interesting <clears throat> that I heard that uh, they were questioning people about if we move from 24 hours to 25 hours, what would you do with the extra hour? The people that develop applications, they said, I'd spend that extra hour coding. So you can kind of get where their headspace is at. Economic development opportunities. We had talked about the need to support and, and nurture startups. Open data does that. Data value added resellers, sector innovation and, and jobs is another area. So when we look at it from a point of view of how large is this market, there was a study done uh, by the European Commission uh, dealing with public information. And they talked about the uh, mobile, uh, mobile apps market reaching $35 billion by 2015. So that's very significant. It's one of the fastest growing segments that exists out there. I don't know that I would agree with that number. I don't know how they came up with it, but it gives you kind of the scope, uh, you know, how large, uh, uh, how large we're talking about. And so what feeds these applications that are being developed, particularly in the mobile market? It's the open data. I've just taken three examples here. Uh, one on the left-hand side is called Recollect, a, a private uh, company, a startup that's doing quite well now. And this was all about recycling, providing uh, information to the citizens through their, uh, through their uh, smartphones as to when the garbage was going to be collected uh, or recycled. The next one is dealing with another big area around applications. <clears throat> That's in the transportation sector. Everybody wants to know, when's the next bus? Do I have time to go and grab a coffee before the next bus or subway is coming? And the, the one on the right-hand side is really dealing with health inspections. And so I'm here. Where are the restaurants nearby that have got an A rating on the health inspections? I don't want to go to someone that's got a C or has failed. So when we look at the public-facing views of open data, uh, I've illustrated a couple here. The top left is the, uh, the open data portal for uh, Montreal. And on the bottom, we have a lot of citizen engagement things happening and things such as uh, unconferences and GovUps uh, or GovCamps, change camps that are defining the issues, and by defining the issues, actually identifying opportunities, uh, you know, to improve the level of service or increase the service. And, and one of the things that you find, again, when I spoke about the people taking the extra hour to do coding, you talk about hackathons and code fests. This is where the people get together and code, and they love it. Now, I've been involved in three or four of these. I don't know how to code, but I do know I'm an end user, so I provide design uh, considerations uh, and also do research for these people. While they're doing the coding, I'm doing research. So it's a community building exercise as well. Next. And it's very active. These people are creating these communities on their own. This is not something that's being pushed by government. It's grassroots. And I think a number of times we've heard about the importance of grassroots. And open data certainly illustrates the power of grassroots. And I've just illustrated four here, being uh, Montreal, Open Data London, Open Data Ottawa, Open Data Halton. Uh, 
Uh, these are all citizen-led groups, and they've made great progress in both developing applications and recommending things for governments to do in moving open data together. And then the last kind of connection I think that's really important is the fact that that open data, whether it's government data or corporate data, community data or science data, all of that feeds into the ability for us to innovate uh, and move towards uh, an intelligent community. And what we want ultimately is to move towards a world-recognized uh, intelligent nation. So with that, uh, I want to turn it over to uh, Barry to provide uh, some insight into the work we're doing. Great. Thank you.